The epithelia are a very important collection of tissues. They often are the tissue that's involved with other substances in the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, uh, the waste that we produce, the external world all comes into contact with our epithelium basically for the first time. Epithelium is a rather involved set of tissues and so we want to approach it in a couple of different ways. First talking a little bit about how they work to perform their major functions and then looking at how we uh, classify them based on what they look like under the microscope. Epithelia are for covering and lining, as I've said several times by now, but it's important to consider that the cells that make up epithelium come very, very close together, and there are a few important structures that help with that. Now, these sorts of structures that we see are going to keep all of the cells very, very closely together. And for the most part, we can think of epithelial structures as being like brick walls or tiles. There's no space between the cells. They come up very closely together and they're very tightly attached to each other. Um, this is an important point to consider because the cells in an epithelium don't have blood vessels between them. Um, and in some epithelia that's not a very big deal, but in others it is. And so we consider epithelia as avascular tissues. They don't have blood vessels invested into the tissue itself. Any blood supply has to come from an adjacent tissue. The first frame here shows what's called a tight junction, which is usually a band along where one cell comes in contact with all of its neighbors, and the two cell membranes are kind of stitched together by uh, some transmembrane proteins that interconnect between the two uh, membranes. And they don't allow very much through. There are some very small particles that can cross through a tight junction, but for the most part uh, it doesn't let much through, almost acting like a mortar between the cells, uh, keeping everything very tightly together. Then we have the anchoring type junctions, which aid in the same function of keeping the, the cells together. Um, there are spot anchors called desmosomes, um, the first of the three in this panel. Um, and then there's the adherens, or a band-like structure again, but much more closely packed together. Um, and then finally there are hemidesmosomes, which isn't holding epithelial cells together to each other, but rather attaching the epithelium to the surrounding or adjacent tissue, the basement membrane. And then finally we have gap junctions, which are like grommets between two cells. They're ion channels that pass through the membrane of one and connect to another ion channel in the membrane of the other. And those two ion channels come together, uh, making connexons that allow ions to move freely from one cell to the other. Gap junctions are usually a small collection of these connexons, um, making a point of transfer of ions between the cells. In classifying the epithelia, it's based on two major criteria. One is the layers, and the other is the cell types. Now for layers, there can either be one layer, which is called a simple epithelium, or multiple layers, which is called a stratified epithelium. Multiple layers can be two layers of cells, or can be hundreds of layers of cells. Um, it doesn't matter how many layers, just more than one is stratified. Um, the cell types are called squamous, cuboidal, and columnar. Squamous, which comes from the word that we get scale from, uh, means flat, and those are going to have flat-shaped nuclei as well. Then cuboidal means cube-shaped, and so in section it's going to look like a square mostly. 
and also it'll have a fairly round nucleus centrally located in the cell. And then there's columnar cells, which means column-shaped or tall and thin, and they'll usually have a round or oval nucleus offset somewhere, not usually in the middle of the cell, but uh, often towards the basal side of the cell. The stratified epithelia are classified by cell shape as well, except that it's not that they're necessarily going to be composed of all the same type of cell. Now, this is true of any type of epithelium, but it's important when we're thinking about stratified. Epithelia are organized or polarized in a particular way. There's a basal layer or basal side and an apical layer or apical side. On the basal side, we have a basement membrane, which in all of these pictures is represented by the gray line on the bottom of the picture. And then the apical side of any epithelium is going to be next to the empty space, so to speak, or the lumen of the digestive tract or small intestine or blood vessel or <clears throat> the empty space beyond our body for the skin, or one of the cavities that's lined with an epithelium, that's the apical side. Apex means towards the top, base means towards the bottom. It's always relative to that. Base is next to the basement membrane, and apical is next to the space that's being covered, I mean, lined. Um, so in a stratified epithelium, what defines it for cell type is what the apical most layer of cells is. In stratified squamous epithelium, it's covered with flat cells. Um, there might be all different shapes of cells, and oftentimes in stratified squamous epithelia, there are cuboidal and maybe even columnar cells towards the basal side, but the apical layers of cells is always squamous. Stratified cuboidal epithelium is going to have cuboidal cells in the apical layer. Usually stratified cuboidal epithelia are just two layers of cuboidal cells, um, so all of them are the same type, and there's usually just two layers. Uh, stratified columnar epithelium are not always multiple layers of columnar cells. It might be an apical layer of columnar cells and a basal layer of um, cuboidal cells or something like that. But again, always the apical cells are what define the stratified epithelium. There's another type of epithelia represented here called a pseudostratified epithelium. It's really a simple columnar epithelium, but the cells are very oddly shaped and the nuclei are in a lot of different positions. So under the microscope, it can appear as if it's a stratified columnar epithelium because the cell membranes aren't always that easy to discern. Um, but it's really just a special case of the simple epithelia. The stratified epithelia have a special case, so to speak, also, which isn't represented here, and will be shown in the later picture, which is called transitional. It's multiple layers of cells, it's just the cells in the apical layer are not easily classified by shape. They have their own kind of shape, and we'll look at that later on. So as we classify the epithelia by layers and cell types, we can come up with six different types, obviously. Simple squamous, simple cuboidal, simple columnar, stratified squamous, stratified cuboidal, stratified columnar. But then there's a special case for each of the layer types. The special case of single layer cells is pseudostratified. And then the special case, which we'll look at in a little while, for the stratified is the transitional epithelium. So we want to talk about these uh, a little bit more closely. Um, we're going to look at each type up close, um, micrographs and representations of what they look like um, in the next set of pictures. This is simple squamous epithelium. Uh, it's again a single layer of flat cells, and the nuclei are usually flat in appearance also. Um, the micrograph that we have here is of the alveoli in the lung, which is a good example of that. Um, some of what we're looking at here is rather uh, thick looking tissue. So it's just the very thinnest parts here that are just a single cell thick 
are the alveolar walls that are made of simple squamous epithelium. Um, blood vessels are also made of simple squamous epithelium. A structure in the kidney called the glomerular capsule is made of that. Um, and there's a simple squamous epithelium that covers the outside of major organs like the lungs and the heart and the lower digestive tract and lines the inside of those cavities. The cavity where the lungs are found, the cavity where the heart's found, and the cavity where the lower digestive tract's found. Uh, simple squamous epithelia being very thin is great for absorbing and secreting fluids um, or gases in the case of the lungs. Um, and we see that quite a bit. In excreting the fluid in the cavity space surrounding the lungs, heart, or lower digestive tract, it also acts as part of a lubrication barrier, helping to uh, cut down on friction as those organs move within their cavities. A simple cuboidal epithelium is a single layer of fairly regularly shaped cells square kind of cells with very regular round nuclei right in the middle. Now, when we actually look at this type of epithelium, they actually can appear less than square, especially when they're curved around a very tight space, like in this micrograph, in which case they have to be kind of compressed a little bit. But um, these are tubules within the kidney represented here. And in a lot of tubular, tubular structures, we see simple cuboidal epithelia. Um, they're again very good for secretion and absorption, which is what they do in the kidney here. A simple columnar epithelium again is tall, thin cells, column-shaped cells in a single layer. The, the nuclei usually appear as round to oval-shaped nuclei, offset usually on the, the basal side of the cells, but they're often lined up very neatly in a row. Um, the example that we see here in the micrograph is the lining of the small intestine. And we see in the micrograph something that's not in the simple picture of the epithelium, which are occasionally, or practically every other cell, seems to be what's called a goblet cell. Goblet cells look like wine goblets, which is where they get their name. They're a type of columnar cell, however, the apical region is filled with watery mucus, which does not pick up a lot of stain. So under the micrograph, uh, it looks like the top of a wine glass, so to speak. Um, on the far right side, we have a representation of what a goblet cell would look like with a bunch of secretory vesicles filled with watery fluid in them, which is what does not pick up the stain. Um, we see goblet cells in Col uh, columnar epithelia, both the simple columnar epithelium here, and then we're going to see them also in a pseudostratified epithelium. This is pseudostratified epithelium, or pseudostratified columnar epithelium, as some sources will refer to it. Uh, the example we have in the micrograph here is the lining of the trachea, or uh, as we're going to get to know it, uh, mostly in the respiratory epithelium through the, most of the respiratory tract. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple other places where it's found, but until A and P2, uh, they don't really become important. Now, uh, pseudostratified columnar epithelia, again, look like they're a stratified epithelium um, because the nuclei are not in a nice little row like the simple columnar epithelium. Uh, however, they are all one cell size. They go all the way from the basal to the apical surface. Um, the reason why they often appear pseudostratified, like in the trachea, is actually that some of the cells are in the process of growing to their full size. So it's kind of like if you lined up people of varying ages. There'd be short people and they'd be tall people. Nobody'd be standing on each other's shoulders, but the heads would all be at different heights. It's a stretch of a metaphor here, but or simile, but uh, it does, I think, make the point there. Now, the pseudostratified epithelium that we're looking at here, and in fact the one that we just looked at, the simple columnar epithelium, both had cilia on the apical surface. Uh, cilia are projections of the cell membrane, um, which can be involved in various functions. Here in the pseudostratified epithelium, they're a fringe that can move and help push mucus along to get it out of the lungs 
and out of the windpipe and into the digestive tract to be swallowed and uh, reabsorbed into the system. Now we'll consider the multiple layers of cells, which are the stratified epithelia. And again, there's a fourth type, a special case, so to speak, called transitional here. This is stratified squamous epithelium. Um, we're looking at a micrograph of the lining of the esophagus, which is part of the upper digestive tract. Um, another place where we'd see this would be uh, as the epidermis of the skin. Now, those two examples are actually two different types of stratified squamous epithelium. In the skin, we have what's called keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, and in other soft tissues, we see non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Keratin is a protein that's found in the cells of the epidermis of the skin, which give it some strength, and we don't see keratin in these other uh, regions that have stratified squamous epithelium. But in all of those places, stratified squamous epithelium is most important for being protective. Anywhere that we need protection, there's going to be stratified squamous epithelium. Um, so obviously, the epidermis of the skin all over our body, lining the oral cavity, the pharynx, which is our throat, and the esophagus, which is carrying food down to our stomach. Um, all of those have stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, to protect against acidic or uh, overly hot or overly cold foods that we might ingest. Um, the lining of the uh, vagina also has a stratified squamous epithelium, again offering some protection, and the opening of the anus will have it as well. Really anywhere that you see it, it's for protection, and anywhere that needs protection, you should assume that there's going to be stratified squamous epithelium there. If you hear protection, think stratified squamous epithelium. Now, we're starting to look at stratified epithelia, and so blood supply is an issue. And really, stratified squamous epithelium is where we see this most importantly. The blood supply is going to be in the adjacent tissue, which is a connective tissue, which is on the basal side of this tissue. And blood supplies, oxygen, nutrients, those sorts of things, will be able to diffuse through the epithelium for a certain distance. Any further beyond the blood, the cells won't get nutrients and they'll die. In stratified squamous epithelium, in fact, that's part of the function. It has a dead layer of cells on the outside. Um, and those cells are dead because they're too far away from the blood supply and they stay connected for the most part because you can't hurt cells any more than they're already dead, so it ha adds to an aspect of uh, the protective quality of stratified squamous epithelium. Stratified cuboidal epithelium is a fairly rare epithelium, and the example I'd like to use is questionable at best. What we're looking at here are sweat glands in the skin and towards the base of the sweat glands there are stratified cuboidal epithelial walls of those ducts. Now the lumen of the duct is actually quite small and so it's hard to see here and it's probably collapsed as the tissue has been processed for microscopy. Um, but there are definitely multiple layers of cells here. Um, they just don't really look that cuboidal. The reason why that's sort of acceptable is because the cuboidal epithelium is glandular in nature. and We'll talk about glandular tissue in a little while. Um, but it does have a layering structure to it in the wall of the duct, so it, it counts there. Um, some sources will also point out stratified cuboidal epithelium for large ducts, like the pancreatic duct or something like that. But the micrograph that we have to look at is a sweat gland in the skin. Now, what I'm presenting for the stratified columnar epithelium is different from the others that we have. There's no micrograph to share with this. And the reason for that is that there's no tissue sample that we have in our microscope slides to represent what it looks like. Um, and because of that lack, uh, all that I want you to pay attention to for this tissue is that it exists within the classification structure 
Um, we won't be considering it in lab. It won't be one of the tissues that we look at. This is actually a great thing because pseudostratified epithelium, if it's going to be confused with anything, is going to be confused with stratified columnar epithelium. Um, both of them are going to have apical cytoplasm, space from the top of the uh, nuclei to the apical surface of the cells. And then below that, there's going to be a jumble of nuclei. If you run into that situation, you don't have to try to figure out which it is. You just know that it's pseudostratified because we won't be considering stratified columnar epithelium. It's a very, very rare epithelium. There's really only one good place to look at it, and we don't even have a reliable slide source for that in our class. This is transitional epithelium. Again, the special case for the strat stratified epithelium. It is definitely multiple layers of cells. They just aren't easily classified by cell shape, and the apical layer of cells are their own kind of cell. They're sometimes referred to as transitional cells. Now, what we're looking at here is the wall of the ureter, the tube that connects the kidney to the bladder. It's one of two places that has transitional epithelium. The other place is the bladder itself. What transitional epithelium does is it stretches out. So for the bladder, and the ureter, which does the same thing, as it fills with urine, the organ's going to stretch out. But then it can stretch even further because the transitional epithelium allows it to a little extra give there. The transitional cells, these big kind of pillowy cells in the apical surface, can be stretched out and become rather thin. They're not squamous cells in that sense. They're still transitional, but they do adjust to the load necessary when the bladder becomes distended. Now, if the bladder's full, urine's going to back up into the ureters also. So the wall of the ureters have transitional epithelium also to allow for a little bit more volume to be held there before everything has to be voided. When classifying the epithelial tissues based on layers and cell types and including the special cases of pseudostratified and transitional, we come up with eight different types of epithelial tissues. But there's actually a ninth type, which is called glandular tissue. And it's unlike the others because it doesn't fit into the layering or cell shape configurations. It's its own type of tissue. Um, it's really a type of epithelial tissue because it develops out of epithelial tissues. Um, there's two types of glandular tissue. There's endocrine glands and exocrine glands. The micrograph on the left here shows an endocrine gland, specifically the pituitary gland. Um, the cells are all jumbled around. Uh, we're actually seeing this at a sort of low power, so we don't see the individual cells too easily. The little dark spots are the nuclei, and you can see they're sort of clustered around little cobblestone looking shapes, and that's a feature of this type of endocrine gland. Um, exocrine glands, like the sebaceous gland or oil gland that's uh, on the right side in this picture, um, are different in nature. Um, they kind of do look similar to the endocrine gland, except that what we can't see in this picture, they come to an opening of a duct that extends and connects to, in this case, the epidermis. Um, other exocrine glands would be digestive glands or uh, sweat glands, uh, mammary glands, wax glands in your ear, those sorts of things. Those are all exocrine glands, and the endocrine glands are those that secrete hormones. Now, especially the endocrine glands are special because their vascular tissue. Endocrine glands have to secrete hormones into the bloodstream, so there has to be blood vessels through that tissue, which makes it different from all of the other types of epithelia. Um, besides the fact that there's not really a layering structure in here, and the cells can almost be said to look kind of cuboidal, but not really. Um, they're just their own sort of shape. It's just glandular tissue. This table summarizes the eight types of layered epithelial tissues. The first four are simple, the second four are stratified, um, and 
summarizes where they're located and their major functions. Um, so this is a good reference to get that information. Glandular tissue isn't on this particular table, but it is an epithelial type tissue. Consider this question um, when you feel that you've reached an answer, hit the next button to go into the next slide, which will re reveal the correct answer. So the epithelial tissue best suited for protection is definitely stratified squamous epithelium. Now, I ask questions of my students later in the course as we're dealing with the various organ systems, both through the rest of AMP1 and into AMP2. And probably one of the questions that is left hanging in the air by most students when I ask it is what epithelium is best for protection? You have to remember protection is stratified squamous epithelium, and stratified squamous epithelium is protection. You can remember this because it's in your skin, it's the epidermis. It's the most protective tissue, and so that's the tissue that's going to be protecting your whole body. Now there are other places that have need for protection, and they have that stratified squamous epithelium also, but remember the skin, and that's a clue to where the best protection is found.